Well, good morning to you. Welcome to Forsyth Baptist Church. We're glad you're here this morning at 804 Tanger Drive in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And uh, if you have your Bible with you this morning, we turn into the New Testament as we're uh, working our way through uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. Uh, we're in chapter 7, verse 26 uh, this morning. And, uh, or verse 25, let's go to 25, if you will. Verse uh, 25 this morning. And uh, let's write here to this church. Now remember, Paul's writing to Corinth. Corinth, a big cosmopolitan city in his day, in the first century, had people from all over the area there, was doing a lot of business, a lot of things going on. It could You could easily uh, draw a line over a picture of Corinth over top of many of our own here in America and other world cities where you have a lot of things going on in the modern world. Let's look at this this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. And those who mourn as if they did not. And those who are happy as if they were not. And those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use things of the world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How can he, be ple how can he please the Lord? Uh, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of, his of this world. How can he please his wife? And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the affairs, the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can she please her husband? I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, in an undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels that he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. Not He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin. This man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies. She is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I too have the spirit of God. So as we look through that, and I was reading from the NIV, I'm sure you'll be able to follow along there. There can be some differences, but I don't think anything's terribly significant in the sense that it's going to throw this out of whack. Paul, we know that Paul in the last few uh, verses in chapter seven and even other, he is answering questions that have been brought to him uh, about what to do about certain things from people in the church. So these are Christians in a Christian church in Corinth who are from various backgrounds, being Jewish or Gentile and coming from all those things that the culture of, the, of that time and all that, they came in to this church that was set up by Paul a few years ago in his time and uh, and now are experiencing the real things. I call it the realities of what it means to live a Christian life in a pagan society by people who came from a pagan society, whether it was Jewish or not, okay? Uh, because again, none of these people, apart from people who've trusted Christ, were Christians and so the idea is they came into this church as Jewish people living in Jewish Judaism or, or Gentile people living under the Gentile cultures. And there are various cultures and various belief systems as there are today. So that's why I don't think this is 
as, as hard as some things are to connect sometimes, I think we, we should be able to, if we have a little grip of what's going on and how this works, we should be able to understand how some of this works and how it applies to us in our time. Uh, clearly, uh, Paul uses a marriage relationship framework. So he is talking about a very specific set of circumstances in that time about marrying and not marrying and about that situation. And I don't think, I don't think you can read this and not get the sense of urgency that the people who asked about this felt and the people and Paul who heard it and answered them felt. Paul is not operating with some long-term uh, thing here. He's operating in a very urgent situation. He sees this as an urgent situation and these instructions are going to be given in the context of this shortness of time which kind of throws out the window this idea that somehow or other that, uh, that everybody in Paul's day believed that the end of the world was going to come, but it really wasn't going to because it had to be sometime a long time away. And that there was no signs that they could point to and say, this is, this is something. Because Paul says, it's short. The time is short. That doesn't mean short as in millions of years. It means short as in, why would he say that? Because he believed what he read, what he heard from Jesus, what he got from Jesus when Jesus spoke to his disciples. And I'll push that too much. But the point is, Paul is not saying this to, to, to pretend to get people to do something. He's saying it because he believed it. And his reasons are going to be clear here, hopefully, as we go along. But the reason Paul is answering this, they lived in a crisis situation. There are several crises going on here. The urgent one was the shortness of time. All right. And you say, well, that's Paul. So you have to look at this and go, well, Paul was totally whacked out because after all, Robbie, this is 2000 years later and people are today. I just saw on the radio. I saw on the news. I saw on the YouTube. I saw it in somewhere that Preachers, it's time is short. Well, you know, it's short. Well, we're going to have to. Do. And some of the, somebody's got to be wrong about this time thing or a time doesn't have any relevance. It just becomes some unending, unknown thing. We can't be, can't wait. We can't use it. In other words, what, why are we set our watches one way or clocks one way or the other? Time has no point. Doesn't matter. The hour, what's an hour? Who knows? I don't know. So keep that in mind because if you lose that, you can you get take all the other things Paul talks about timeliness and the timing of things as something you know un, unsolvable in his day that he was talking about something he didn't know anything about or that he got that all wrong. That's one thing I tell people oftentimes that Paul has not got the timing issue wrong. He's got it right, and what happens is once you get it wrong and once you make him uh, into something else, then everything else you say has to fit some endless. Uh, undetermined, indeterminate time. So it's a crisis because Paul sees the shortness of time and he's talking about their present situation. Look at verse, uh, verse 26. The present crisis, folks, you've got to be out of your mind to come up with some sort of meaning about that that has no present tense to it. Present is present tense. And so Paul is talking about what he considers to be a present crisis that he believes. And by the way, the last verse says that he's also believes he's led by the spirit. So the end of this passage we read puts Paul's saying there when he says that in verse uh, 40, I believe I'm also led of the spirit. So I have the spiritual guidance here of the Lord. And so what I'm telling you here is not something I made up in my mind or dreamed it overnight because I bumped my head or had some bad food or something, right? I believe I'm being led by the Spirit to tell you this. So when Paul says present crisis, he's talking about a present crisis. And in the Christian culture, in a Christian sense, not in the world sense, we have present crisis all the time. There's the war in, in Israel. There's the war in the Middle East, the war in Ukraine. There's a war here. There's this, there's 
We live in a time of great moral uncertainty, but by the way, in case you didn't know that, so did Paul. We live in a constant crisis of this country just folding up under the weight of degradation, corruption, and moral decay, just like Rome did. And it did. And other nations before that just keep going back. Great world powers. They all stand as examples that a environment of moral decay among people, whether they be people God has asked and challenged and given a task to do, or people of just general people, guess what? Moral decay has its own thing. Rot and rust has its own end. You don't have to, if you don't interdict or jump in the middle of it, it will work out as it is. The very present crisis. What is he talking about? Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble and take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus was, folks, let me help you out here. Jesus was talking to some real live dudes, some people in his day. He wasn't looking over, the, over their heads and speaking out into the great distance. You guys don't worry about it, but some people down the road, they're going to have trouble. You know, sometimes we, we, we I understand the, I understand why, but we've got to understand this. Jesus did not tell people stuff that did them no good or had no point, or they were too dumb or too locked in a timeline that didn't fit Jesus that, that had nothing to do with them. They could have said, well, like some people, some people's logic here and their, their understanding of this makes these people totally useless. Jesus was not talking to them. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought they would have said, what? I stood right here. But they come up here and look. I was right there. He was speaking and looking me and these guys all in the eye when he said this. Now, does that mean he has nothing to do with anybody else? No, but it meant it had to have something to do with them. It has something to do with everybody else because he was speaking also in a greater sense to other people. But guess what? It still is relevant because this world is still here and we're going to have troubles. Jesus said so. So Paul says there is a crisis. The Lord said so. Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 said this. In fact, now I don't know what you think in fact means, but in fact, Paul says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone, everyone in Timothy's day and everyone since then will be persecuted. So we will live in persecution. There is no time when persecution is not existent. We personally may not be experiencing that moment, that personal little window at that moment in time, but I assure you it is going on and it, it affects. And we may not even, we may have gotten so immune we don't realize it. But Paul said to Timothy, listen, if you're a Christian, you're going to be persecuted, Timothy, so get over it. Tell, tell your people that. That, applied, that also applied in that very time as it applies today. First Peter, Peter writing, 1 Peter 4, 12, dear friends, do not be surprised. Now, at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter said to his people, to his audience in his day, listen, y'all, don't act like so surprised. Well, oh my God, I thought we were Christians. I thought God loved us and all this. And why is all this terrible stuff happening to us? And Peter said, don't act like it's some strange thing. Because why would he say that? Because Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. And trouble they had. So it is a present crisis in Paul's day. They're having trouble. And the trouble is just getting ramped up in his day. And the soon, the major crisis that's going on here is Paul realizes the clock is ticking to use somebody, some online or on TV preacher's term. The clock is ticking here onto the, to the elimination of a very big deal amongst the Jewish people. And that is what Jesus has already done physically. He has left the temple. And, and I remember mentioning that in Sunday school this morning. I'll mention it again. 
Jesus said and demonstrated, not with his word, only with his words, but with his physical presence, as we read in the Bible, as he walked out of the temple, that great Herod Rodian temple that was a, a exemplary version of Solomon's temple, the idea that this temple, the Jewish temple, where the curtain and the Holy of Holies and all of that was and what that stood for, he walked out and he says, I leave you. He was talking to the people, to the, his Jewish relatives. I leave you all, Southern version, this. And I am leaving that. And by the way, he kicks the dust off his feet. He turns his back on it. These are all symbolic Real, real, real time cultural symbols of rejection. So Jesus has rejected the temple and those who follow what? The temple practices, the old covenant of going down there and burning up animals and cutting their throats and bleeding and blood and smoke and all the other stuff. And I, you know, I'm not going to go into everything. You can read about it. It was a covenant. It was a deal that God had said, do this. And Jesus says, I'm leaving this to y'all. In other words, if that's what you want, you got it. I'm no longer having anything to do with it. No longer meaning never again. So looking for the heifer, waiting for the rebuild and all the other stuff that's being blabbered all over the TV here recently and current events being what they are is over. Jesus had left that a long time ago. As he said, he left it and he said, and furthermore, in Matthew chapter 23, 24, and so on and others, but in there, he says, look, when asked, what about that temple? You see, his disciples were still stuck with Baptist theology, even though they didn't know it. They had the, whoa, 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 wait, wait, whoa, 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 what about the temple? Don't you see how great that is? Jesus said there won't be a rock left on a rock, a stone left on a stone. It's going to be done. I've already left it in person and in spirit, by the way, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is sending it to the temple on an annual basis, and that's where people repent of their sins. That's where people, do you understand what I'm saying here? I, maybe if you don't, go back and look at it. But that's, what, that's where people met God. Jesus said, that's over with. It's done. I, the great I am, me and the Father are one, you know, that, that person, Jesus, I've left it. The spirit of God has left it. I physically left it. And if anybody wants it, go have it. But it's pointless and useless and serves no purpose. It is a, is a sign and a symbol of the breaking of, of closing out a, a history, closing out something. It didn't mean that God's done. It just meant that God was over that. He moved on. What did he do move on to? Well, of course, Jesus says, I, the Holy Spirit is no longer going to dwell over there. He's going to dwell in the hearts of believers. And I'm going to make that happen here down the road in a little bit. Because in other words, I'm going to go to the cross. They're all still shocked about that. Still, the Jew, by the way, Judaism does not believe that. They might say he went to the cross, but they don't believe it had any effectual thing that, that it serves any purpose. Furthermore, they don't believe Jesus Christ as portrayed in the Bible is the Messiah. So I understand why they're having a lot of trouble and why God is still going, I thought I got the message across. I thought people understood that. And I thought some of these Christians who said, well, we're going to have to get this heifer together and get this all built back up and some other stuff that they've come up with the, the create, so that I can come back. So they're putting me on a timeline based on certain things. I already left the place. I'm done with it. Build all of it you want. Put all the red cows you want to in there. Do all that stuff you want to. It don't have nothing to do with me. I'm done. If you want to know me and you want to get saved, whether you're Jewish or not, you need to come to my son Jesus, the Lord and Savior who died on the cross, who lives forevermore, who said, I am the way. In case you couldn't understand what all that other stuff meant, just scratch over that and jump to John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me, not by the temple, not by dead cows, not by millions of people dying, not by wars and rumors of wars, not any of that stuff. Me. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you guys are nuts. There ain't going to be none of that left in a generation. Now, a generation, when Jesus said it, could only mean two things. Something that nobody understood, or either it meant what they considered to be a generation of about 40 years. 
You understand this? Jesus said that to those people. Either he just told them something they had no idea. They could, they surely they couldn't, they didn't believe it or they couldn't quite see how that could happen. But nobody thought Jesus could die and come back to life. Nobody thought that God could get, would die on the cross and come back to life. Nobody thought God, anybody but God could save people. And God said, yeah, that's true because I am God, Jesus said, and I can save you, but you're going to have to trust me and believe in me. And they said, well, I don't know about that because after all, we can't believe that. So you really don't believe God. The people who don't see Jesus as Messiah have denied the cross. They've denied the Bible. They've denied Jesus' words himself. I can't help that, what their ethnicity is. That's how it is. Paul says, listen to me, y'all. There's a present crisis. This whole Jewish thing that they're arguing about and all that. And by the way, all this virgin, non-virgin, getting married stuff. What's that got to do with this? It's the fact that that's, what, that's how they were, they were wrangling because they had rules. You know, they had rules about getting married and not getting married. And they thought, it, you understand, cultural rules and religious rules and all that stuff. And so they're all wrapped up in the rules that they had lived by for a thousand years. Right. They had all these rules. And so they're worried that they're going to cause God to be mad at them over these rules that, that they had previously existed. When that when Jesus left the covenant. The old covenant and the killing of the cows and the chickens and the birds and all that stuff is over with. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, in case you didn't get it right, he says in there, he is the great high priest. There were no other priests. There's not going to be another one coming along later. He's the one. There's no more sacrifices. I don't care when you want to time it out. There will be, there are no more legitimate sacrifices because Jesus says, I'm the great one. And the book of Hebrews says so. So there are no, all that sacrifice ain't going to do no good when it happens if these people are right. Won't make no difference. God still ain't changed his mind about it. And so this is why this is a big deal. Paul is using this framework of a marriage and these relationships, which you and I don't really get. I mean, we don't understand it completely because it's not our history that way exactly. So he's using that. That's why I'm talking about it. But the destruction of Jerusalem is the present crisis. It's the one that's laying ahead for the Christian, because Paul's addressing a Christian crisis. A crisis of the fact that there are still people clinging to the Jewish temple. Still people holding on to the building, if you will. There are people today in for, at Forest Heights Baptist Church, not here, maybe present, but people who've come here and gone here, who still are agonizing over a building that we destroyed a while back. Uh, you know, for, for reasons that it's just it's a building. It was a real estate deal thing, right? It doesn't have nothing to do with your salvation. It never did. This building don't have nothing to do with your salvation. If you're holding on to this building, what, if you, what are you going to do when it's gone? If you're trusting in something that passes away, what are you going to do when it passes away? We live in a constant set of deterioration. That's the truth. That's, it was true then and that, in that sense, Paul was looking at that destruction of that old covenant and represented by the fact that Jerusalem fell and Jesus had warned and gave plenty of heads up, just like he does today. You keep on chasing down this cultural moral hole and making these moral relative decisions to fit society and the culture, you're going to go down a hole. You will be caught up in the blast radius of the judgment of God upon these moral people. It may not change your salvation fact, but it will change your life situation. You know that if you live in a neighborhood where there is drugs and alcohol and shooting and killing all around, you can be a true Christian. You can live there. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm just making a point here about this. That, But if some one of them moral decadent things happens around you and it somehow reaches in and grabs you in the sense that you get robbed or you get shot or something. You didn't do anything wrong. You were not doing anything. You just happened to live there. And this is, and by the way, there, there, as time goes on, there are more and more places like this in America. That used to be, we think nothing happened like that, but now immorality and the destruction that goes with that sin is all around us. So you could be just right standing up and you're sitting in your living room watching uh, Billy Graham. Adrian Rogers and reading your Bible at the same time and singing hymns and a bullet come whizzing in there because of some random, you know, criminal activity outside and kill you. Let me tell you something. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have just left the terrible world and entered into heaven. Now, I'm not advocating advance doing that on purpose, 
But I'm saying you're still saved. However, the consequences, the blast radius of the sin of the world has affected you. The blast radius of the sin in the Middle East is affecting people now noticeably. It's always been going on. There's, no, there's never really been any peace there. Because all the people without Jesus will never have peace. I don't care if you're living rich and high on the hog and you know, and you're like Jeff Bezos, you can move from the the tax place uh, the taxiest place in the world, Washington, or the what he considers to be, you know, dangerous place down to Miami, you know. He, he took his he took his immorality with him, his sinfulness with him. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be no peace for him nor anybody else. I don't care what you're gender or background is so he says that so in verse 29 and following he says here's going to happen there's a near future event here look at verse 29 listen what i said i already mentioned this already the time is short paul wasn't joking he said the time is short did he know that these people were all going to die well everybody knows that somebody's going to die we're going to die people been dying all along so he didn't mean their death necessarily as in their you know, biological, he wouldn't make it, well, I can say to anybody I meet, you're going to die. <laughs> Whoa, that's really prophetic, Robbie. How do you know? Well, I don't know exactly when. Oh, well, then you don't really know when. Paul had a timeline. Jesus says it's going to happen in this generation. He was part of the generation that was in that framework between 30 and 70. He's a, he, matter of fact, this is probably right just about in the middle to upper half of that time frame. Somewhere after the 50, in the 50s or early 60s. So he sees it as short, really it's getting close. This, this, this major event where the, where the temple that Jesus pointed to was not going to be there, which people still said, oh, that can't happen. That ain't never going to happen. We'll never elect a, a president who's a dead man walking. We'll never see homosexuality taught in school as a subject matter. We'll never see when, when school doesn't have nothing to do with what parents want. They just go down there and try to turn our kids into different uh, genders or something. Or We'll never, you, you, I guarantee you, there isn't a human being walking asked if they thought something happened in their lifetime whatever time they are, whatever space in life they are, this will never happen. Everybody I've heard from my whole life has said things like that. I'm old. I'm probably saying them. They said them when I was young. I heard them and I probably thought there was things I thought. This ain't never going to happen. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. And yet it did. So there are people back then saying things is never going to happen. And Jesus said, yeah, they are. But go ahead and do whatever you want to because after all, you know, I told you. He said, time is short, Romans 13. Paul, Paul was, not, Paul was not confused. He was not thinking that it was going to be two or 3,000 years. He had a real timeline that he was operating on. And he says to me, these things that you are worried about, this marrying, not marrying, don't do this. He said, listen, if you, gotta, if you want to get married, get married. If you don't want to get married, don't get married. If you, if you're, if you can't keep yourself celibate or sin free, then marry that's what you, I mean, do that. That's, a, that's where that's supposed to, Paul wasn't under any illusion. That's where it belongs. But if you, if you, if that's, if you feel like you want to serve the Lord, you don't, then don't. Paul was saying to people, listen, whatever you, you need, you feel like you need to do in this situation that's within the framework of Christian uh, acceptability, in other words, within what Jesus said, in other words, be married, that's fine. Be single, that's fine. If you're single and you think, you know, I'm just a little bit too, you know, I can't, I don't think I'm going to resist this, you know, urge to propagate society or whatever, then get married. That's where that belongs. You're not sinning if you don't, and you're not sinning if you do. Again, Paul is only looking at this within the frame. By the way, this is not some, you know, uh, it makes it okay to live in sin. No, it's the idea is within the framework of what marriage, what biblical marriage was, and Paul was never confused about that. He said, within that framework, that's where all these things, will, go ahead, you'll be fine. You need to get on with it. Make a decision. Start following God. This is what I find people all the time do it. Well, when I, and I've heard this all my life when I was just a little kid, uh, dragged to church, you know. I said dragged, I went there, you know, because there was cool things to do. But the point is, I was there, I heard stuff. I've heard people come to my house and witness to my dad. I've heard people come to other, I've heard people talk about it amongst themselves. You know, 
Well, when I get cleaned up, when I get this, when I, they list off all these things they're going to get to, then I'll become a Christian. Well, when I get this and this and this, then I'll come down to church, Robbie, and worship with you. When I uh, get done reading this book and doing this and doing this, then I'll start reading the Bible. Now, I find myself more and more finding that apparently everybody's read the Bible because I get people tell me stuff the Bible says and I ask them, are you sure? And I'm not talking about just quoting it. I'm talking about what they have made some judgment or interpretation about something. And I say, well, let, let's go look. I think I know where you're talking about. Let's go look that up and make sure. And, you know, either that turns them off. They don't want to do that because I think they don't know. And I think they're scared to death if you get a Bible out that somehow God's going to find out that they're a sinner lost without hope in the world. And that suddenly that'll cause them to be in trouble. Now they'll have to do something about it. Or when you get there, they read it and we looked at it and they can't come up with how they got that answer. Either. Otherwise, they'll say, this is their other out. Well, the preacher over there, I saw that on TV, pre TV preacher, they'll tell me this name or they'll tell me some preacher told them or some Sunday school teacher or somebody told them. I said, well, what if you were the one who just had to read that and we just looked at it? What would you say that means? Well, it don't seem to mean that, but I'm not sure. So the point is, people are always going to come up with some excuse. Paul's day was no different then. They had, well, I'm trying to decide. Paul said, make up your mind. This is not, a, if you're worried about being celib uh, being single, that's not a sin. If you're worried about being married, that's not a sin. If, you're, or if you feel like you can't stay unmarried because your sexual desires are so strong that you have to, you'll, you'll sin in outside, then get married. That's fine. Paul says in Romans 13, 11, and do this understanding the present time. There he is again, present time. Paul was either crazy or had, who, who, who had a, an unbelievable understanding of present as meaning something that has a present in some time or other, or is present right now. He says, the hour has already come. Again, this is not some advanced 40 million year future here. He says, in the present time, in case you didn't get that, he says in verse 11, Romans 13, 11, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. What is he talking about? He's talking about what he understood as the, and what Jesus said, the judgment. Now, what judgment is Jesus talking about? Jesus says, listen, fellas, I have left the temple. God is doing something different in a different way. He's still interested in salvation. He still wants people to be saved, but he has Doing it this way. He's showing that it's always been about me, Jesus. And it's always been through me, Jesus. And always about trusting me. And here I am. I'm at the at this pinnacle in, of, of this operation. Here is this, all this stuff in the Old Testament points to me. I don't think you get people, except people who deny Jesus as the Messiah, as agreeing with that, whether they understand what all the Old Testament, it pointed to me. Then I become the it, as the Hebrew said, book of Hebrews says, the ultimate, the pinnacle, the penultimate, the number one. I am the focus of sacrifices, of the law, of, the, of all of that that happened there in the temple. I'm the focus. So here I am, and therefore it is focused on me. And when I, since I'm here, this all needs to go away. This is no longer has any validity in that sense because I have come. The fulfillment of all of that is found in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ then says, I'm that one. So therefore the hour is here. My, your salvation has come. And to me, he means here this ending of this old covenant, if you will, that had not because it was bad, but because it was always pointing to the perfect covenant. And that is Christ to that pointing to that ultimate thing. And everybody who's still chasing or waiting on the ultimate thing will wait until they're dead and no longer relevant and become lost up in that while they're waiting. And they will suffer the consequences of all others who do so, whatever time frame they're in. Because after all, Jesus is the one. If you trust God, you trust Jesus and God in the incarnate, you trust him, he becomes the answer. And since then, Jesus is the place. The Holy Spirit comes from Jesus. So Jesus is our salvation. This is what Christians believe, folks. Jesus has done it. And he says, just so you guys know that I am what I said I am, 
This place is not going to be here in 40 years. And guess what? Some of you will see it. See it gone. And you will know that I was just exactly right about what I've been telling you. Because that is confirmation of the prophet's veracity or truthfulness is that their prophecy comes true. And it wasn't. And you'll stop chasing the temple and all that stuff and start, you'll stop worrying about that and get on with it. That's what Paul's trying to tell him. He's using marriage as a framework. He says, listen, the, 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 furthermore, he doesn't just go there. He does deal with some other things that we have to deal with. He says, look, in verse 30, and he's going to talk about, he's going to list off on some stuff. But in verse 30, he talks about wives, but he also talks about property and stuff that we acquire. He says, as if it were not theirs to keep. If you buy something, don't hold, don't hold on to it. Don't, don't let it become your anchor around your waist, hold you down. Don't worry about it. It ain't going to make no difference. That's what, that's what Paul was saying to them. He said, because one pretty soon you guys own all that property in Jerusalem and in Israel and all pretty soon you people has got all this stuff. It ain't going to matter to you when your life is online. That stuff gets really heavy quick. When you're fleeing from the persecution from the sure destruction of the city of Jerusalem. He said, don't take much with you because you ain't going to have no time. Go back and read it. He said, the world is caught up in all this. The world is worried about property and stuff and things and all this other stuff that he's been talking about, marriage and relationships. He's worried about, it. guess what? In verse 31, it says, for this world in its present form is passing away. Now, some people said, well, Robbie, the world is still here. How come he... How come that isn't true? Because Paul was talking about the present form. The present form he was talking about was this, this covenant, this old Judaism that was creating persecution for them people in that day as well. And that kind of stuff. He said, this is not going to, this is because remember, what, what are these people worried about? They're worried about following the Jewish rules about getting married and not being married and how that works. They're arguing about whether circumcision, not particularly this passage, but they're arguing about that. We know that goes on and on. This don't matter anymore. Let it go. Don't hold on to this world too tight or the things of it. He said it's going to be hard. Now, why was he advocating people to stay single if you're single? Because he says we want, we want to be sure that we're not trapped. Because if you're, if you're married, you have responsibilities. Paul was not saying shirk your responsibilities. He knows that we have responsibilities. Married people have responsibilities. And he said it's going to be a little harder didn't say it was impossible. Didn't say it was a sin. He said it's going to be harder to manage this singular devotion and this, uh, this, this situation in the present sense of the, of the impending doom that was about to come. Can you imagine you're in Jerusalem, you're living there under, and, you're, and you have a business and you have a family and stuff, or you're going to get a family, and you knew that the whole place was going to be blown up basically in just a little while? Well, let's see now. I've got to make sure I get my family out. This is this is a real thing. You, we worry about that. That's real. That's should, and we should. We have a responsibility. When we take on a responsibility, you have a responsibility. You're, you're expected to keep your obligations. That's what the Bible says. So he says, this is what it is. Jesus said, brothers will betray brothers in Mark 13, 12. To death, his father and his child, children will rebel against their parents and have put them put to death. This is all happens under this destruction of Jerusalem. These are events that happen. So he says, think about what you're doing. Be prepared to take on these responsibilities because they will have their own set of consequences and difficulties. It's not a sin to take on these responsibilities. It's just remember what you signed up for. This is what people are having problems with today when they can't keep their commitments, right? If Jesus said in Luke 20, 20, uh, 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, and mother, did Jesus think people are to hate their parents? No, what he's doing is he's do, using a hyperbole, a extended a super thing here to describe it. He said, if you're not willing to let that go for me, put, and what does he mean by that? Go out and get rid of them? No, he means put them in the proper order. And, he, and he, by the way, he goes on to say mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even your own life. Notice that what I'm saying, does Jesus hate people's lives? No. Such a person can't be my disciple. I've told people many times, I said, this is ridiculous. You think Jesus, if you do, then you need to get rid of all these people. Get rid of them. And by the way, at the end of that, you're going to get rid of them. I'm not advocating suicide, but you, you get my point. Jesus is saying, look, in those priorities of life, 
We have priorities. If you're going to be my disciple, I have to be number one, numero uno, commandment one, two, right? We got to be, God's got to be first. If he's not first, these other things are not going to be work out right either. And they're all going to be a burden and a problem for you. Once you put God first, everything will work out. He will be right. But when God's not first, stuff just don't work out. That's what Paul was talking about. That's what he's, that's what he, that's what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't advocating that. Otherwise, you guys, we, we, we go like, wow, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This world is passing away. Verse 31 again, because why? Why are we to focus on God? Why do we need to put our lives, whatever situation we're in, in the proper order? Because this world is passing away. In a sense, it is going away. And that day, there, there was destruction. In our day, there's moral decay and all these things. We need to be sure we're in the proper order. We put things in the right order so God can help us keep our responsibilities, manage our commitments, right? We need our undivided devotion to God. God said, you got to devote yourself to me. And by the way, if you want this stuff that you, we all want and need, food, shelter, and that, then you got to give it to me or put your devotion to me so I can give it back to you because he will add these things he said to us. Remember that? Jesus goes into a big long speech about this in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. I won't read it, but the point is, so what are we, what are we left with here this morning? Well, I think what we do is Paul is talking about, and I know you said, well, I thought you were going to get into all this virgins and all this stuff. Well, I mean, yes, but the point is, this is all culturally relevant to Paul's day in that sense, but the that the principle applies in this way. Paul was right. Time was short. President's passing away. The things were changing in that day. He he knew that because Jesus said so. He doesn't he doesn't project this into the distant future. What's what's relevant here is the principle that we're to decide what we're going to do. Who's first? Me, you, or God? Put go, the Lord first. Make up your decision. Decide. Get, get with it. Make up your mind, right? Verse 35, he says, I'm saying this for your own good. This whole body of things here, not to restrict you, but that you may live in the right way. Look, undivided devotion to the Lord. You see, God is still a jealous God. He hasn't changed his mind about that. He wants our undivided devotion. He does promise that he will add to us the things that we are, we're already divided about. We're worried about this thing and that thing, our family, people, and property and such. He said, don't worry, I will add to that what you need and what, what I'm giving to you. Don't worry about it. But you're going to have to be devoted to me first because if I'm not first, this other stuff ain't going to make no difference to you. It's going to be a hindrance to you. It's going to be a burden. Keep your commitments because that's what Paul's saying. If you're married, stay married. Work it out. Commit yourself to God. Then God will help you commit yourself to your wife and your family. He said, these words in verse 40, as I said, this is not something I'm making up. He says, I think that I too have the spirit of God. What does he say? I think that I am speaking from the spirit of God. He didn't say that because he didn't believe it. He was in doubt. He was taking a vote. He's saying to this church, what I am telling you is from God. Folks, People say to me, well, how do you know? I say, because it's in the Bible and the Bible's all the word of God from the beginning to the end. We just need to be sure we handle it right, that we don't turn it into something that the newspaper tells us what it means or this tells We look at it and say, listen, it's, it's written to a group of people, but it, we can take some application for it. But it, it can't be that it don't make any sense. The people that told it to didn't know nothing about it. They, he, just, he, was just, he was just using them as a bounce. He was bouncing a signal off them for us because God knew we was going to be here, which I believe he does, but he didn't, he wasn't not telling them because it was helpful to them. It was helpful to them too. Well, in any event, we're going to, we're going to end with the idea that this is a crisis. We live in a crisis as all people who, as a Christian people who really do have always lived in a crisis. There's always something trying to jack with our faith, trying to turn you around, kind of take your time and your devotion. We need to re realize that we need to be undividedly devoted to God first, and these things will be added unto you, according to Jesus. And that Paul was saying that to this church who was struggling with what should we do first and what should we do second and what about this, what about that.
Folks, you've got to be. Now, listen, if you're not a Christian, this won't make a bit of sense to you. If you're not a Christian, if you don't understand this, if you're not a Christian, Paul would say, listen, you've got to become a Christian. You've got to get, you've got to get Christ. You won't, this won't work. You're not devoted. First off, you're not devoted to God. He's not first. If you're not a Christian, if you're a Christian, he's not first. You're in trouble. You need to get straightened up. And maybe God's twisting around on you to get you pointed, figured out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that Paul uses this time, this church in Corinth and these crises that they face and their struggles with their everyday lives and the things that everyone struggles with in different times to put their priorities in order. Then in a crisis situation, Lord, you already know and that you have asked us to put you first. Please put you first. Put you first. You are a jealous God and you want to be first. And for Christians, Lord, we need you to be first. Or this other stuff will never work itself out. And we'll never be able to keep commitments to make decisions. Help us, Lord, to realize that. And then, Lord, let us live by that. And always making adjustments as we do because, you know, Lord, sin creeps in. And we, we get off our plan. We get off that first God first thing. And we thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to be that. Because if we can't put you first, how can we ask anybody else to put you first? If we won't do it, how can we ask anybody else to do it, Lord? Help us be good witnesses in Jesus' name. Amen.